Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Darcy LaRue, Vice President here at Crystal Fountains. I have the good fortune to be your host today, and I thank you all for joining. I'm excited as we have a global attendance here today with attendees from throughout North America, multiple parts of Europe, and the Middle East. Today's presenter is my good friend and colleague, Simon Gardner, Crystal Fountains Director of Creative Design. Simon has been involved with water in the water feature industry for over 20 years and has been the lead water feature designer on dozens of water feature projects internationally. Some of his past projects of note include Umm Al Amaret Park or Mother of the Nation Park in Abu Dhabi, the Alaskan Adventure at Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo in Nebraska, USA, and Minitsia Legacy Tower in Warsaw, Poland. Some of his upcoming work that is currently being commissioned includes the Fair Lima Town Center in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Brentwood Town Center in Vancouver, Canada, and the one we at Crystal are most excited for, the Central Al Wassel Plaza at Expo 2020 in Dubai. And now that I have made him very uncomfortable with too much praise, I'm going to hand it to my friend Simon to begin. Thank you, Darcy. First off, I'd also like to extend my thanks for everybody who's actually attending today. Uh, we do have a large audience of quite a diverse group of people uh, between landscape architects, architects, design builders, aquatic designers, artists, and I'll say others, uh, just not to typecast anybody specifically. So first off, a quick introduction of who Crystal Fountains are for some of the people that, who may not know us. Um, <clears throat> so we're actually a family owned and operated company here in Canada. Um, we're actually a third generation. We're actually a quality manufacturer, especially componentry. We have a consultancy division, a fabrication shop, and also a research and development wing. As mentioned, our head office is here in Toronto where we do a lot of our actual fabrication and manufacturing. We also have two satellite offices in Dubai and Warsaw. So today's webinar, water features waste too much water. Overall agenda, we should be speaking for about 30 minutes. Some of the things we're gonna cover, the numbers, everything is about big data now. So we're gonna get into some of the actual stats and numbers, micro macro, talking about perspectives, design integration. So different elements to look at when we're looking at water conservation, and then really the value proposition. And we'll end with a question and answer period. So first off, I just want to quantify this actual presentation. So it is only 30 minutes. So it's really a 50,000 foot sort of level looking at water conservation itself. Um, we will have that question and answer period in itself. So we will be able to get into some of the nuances. Um, but as you'll see through the actual presentation, there are some topics that could be its own webinar. So water features waste too much water. I feel like I have to say aid because I'm Canadian, but factor fiction. So what I want to concentrate on is really waste, the word waste. So let's define waste. It's an act or an instance of using or expending something carelessly or to no purpose. So carelessly or no purpose. So big data, we got to have the numbers to support ourselves. So we're going to get into some of this actual data. Again, as Darcy had mentioned, there is a white paper that justifies some of these actual data points. There's several different web pages and we can't afford that for the interested people. So first off, I want to look at the actual water feature itself. <clears throat> and for a lot of our aquatic designer design build contractors that are on the actual webinar today, uh, for the rest of the group, I just want to substantiate the, the fact that there are no real sort of prices per square footage, like swim pools or evaporative loss per square footage uh, for these actual water features. Each water feature is unique to its own environment and it is custom. That said, we need to quantify some sort of data. So what we've decided is to take a traditional water feature itself. This is actually University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. And so what we're doing is trying to quantify the actual water usage for that. So 20 foot diameter pool, uh, we're gonna say it's about 18 inches of water and we're gonna say it operates about nine months of the year. So if we're here in Canada, it may only be four or five. The pool volume around 471 cubic feet which is around 3,500 gallons of water. Evaporative loss. So there's all kinds of data, all kinds of different sort of ways to calculate what evaporative loss are. Um, there's actually a very interesting web page called the National Weather Service, and it basically predicts evaporative loss conditions for the last 12 months, and we'll afford that information. And so you can actually quantify by each state what the evaporative loss conditions are. Um, but as many people do know, there are quite a few different variables and several different ways to really calculate evaporative loss. 
So essentially what we've done is we've surmised that there's gonna be about a quarter inch of water loss for this specific water feature. If we're in more arid regions like the Middle East, then we allow for about a quarter inch. If we're up north in Canada, it's usually about one eighth. So for this specific water feature, we'd be about 13,400 gallons of water that would be lost to evaporation throughout the year. Backwashing. So this is critical for any sort of water feature itself. And again, it is specific to the actual design of the water features mechanical electrical system. But there is a process to clean organic debris from the actual system. And so we're going to be on the conservative side and essentially say that we're going to backwash this system twice a week. And that equates to about 9,400 gallons of water. And in our allowance, we're also going to allow for the actual cleaning of the pool. So this may happen at the actual winterization or the spring startup of the pool. But essentially what we allow for is two volumes of the actual pool contained. So that's about 7,000 gallons. So in total, we have about 29,800 gallons of water that's consumed per year. And so if we look at that over the actual nine months, it's around 108 gallons per day. So it is a small amount of water for sure. So how do we actually compare that 108 gallons? So what we'd like to do now is really look at things that we don't necessarily register um, how we actually use the water. So simple things like flushing toilets. Um, as of 1990, 1992, there are new standards for economical flushing of toilets. And so they use about 1.6 gallons. Older toilets use about 3.5 gallons. Showers, anywhere from 15 to 25 gallons per five minute shower. So if you have a teenager, you times that by four or five, you may get up to 100 gallons easily. Bathtub, again, depends on the size, how full you have it, 37 gallons. Brushing your teeth, this is an interesting one, and I think this is where it really sort of regi registered for me. You're not really aware of how much water you actually use. So if you leave that tap running when you're brushing your teeth, you can use up to five gallons of water. Food production. Food production uses a lot of water. Uh, there's actually stats that say an average family uses over a million gallons of water in the growth of the food that they actually consume throughout the actual year. Very substantial. So beef, about 1,800 gallons per pound. So that regular burger, about a third pound, 660 gallons per burger. Chicken, we all know it's a little bit better in the less water, 468 gallons per pound. Beer. 689 gallons per gallon of beer, 689 to one ratio, 19.8 gallons per cup. And not to exclude the coffee drinkers, 880 gallons for every gallon of coffee or 37 gallons per cup. Again, the use of water is hidden within our everyday existence. So the data, again, most is from the US. Essentially, we say there's about 88 gallons of water for each individual that's used throughout the actual day. So when we compare that to the 108 gallons that's used for actual water features, it doesn't seem that large. So let's look at sort of this perspectives of the actual water features themselves. And so we're gonna look at micro and macro. So when we look at micro, what we're looking at is the mechanical electrical system specifically for that actual water feature. And a majority of the water features are what we call closed loop systems. And so they contain a polyble water source itself. It goes through some sort of piping system to the actual water feature. The water either resides in the actual pool itself or within an actual reservoir. And then through a pumping and filtration system, essentially that is cycled back into the actual water feature itself. And hence the closed loop system. And a majority of the water features in the past have been designed this way. So macro systems. <clears throat> so we have a fresh potable water system here. Um, and again, that is pumped to the actual water feature. And now this is where we start dealing with perceptions. So most people assume that the actual water is going to waste. And so by code compliancy and standards, depending on the municipality, that water typically goes to a sanitary connection itself. And so it connects into other devices, other facilities that are actually using the water, and that goes down to a municipal filtration system itself. And so a larger filtration system that then circulates that actual water and recirculates back to as a potable water source itself. Some interesting fact. Again, US data, 
Uh, public water supply is about 38 billion gallons of water per day for domestic and public use. So a huge amount of water is actually consumed throughout our everyday existence. What's interesting here in Toronto, we recently had conversations with the municipality and they actually have a favor for these open loop systems. And so as you can imagine, they're really looking at this at the larger scale. And so their belief is that consolidating air under one facility, essentially there's a lot more efficiencies in technology, in resources, in individuals themselves. So you have educated people with redundancies within their actual systems to make sure that the water source is safe. And so it reduces their actual liability. And so when we do look at these actual systems, if we look at the grander things and see how that fits into the greater system in itself, we may find that more people are pushing towards these open loop systems to reduce their actual liability and reduce some of the actual costs. Oh, design integration. So you hear me state that essentially we use 108 gallons per day for water features themselves. So what we want to do is we want to look at several different things to see if we can reduce that by 50%. And by implementing some of these different sort of techniques in technologies, we can get that down. So the first thing is really the holistic integration. And unfortunately, most of the water features that we deal with have been left late in the design process. And some of that is just because the actual design group and the owners may not buy into the overall concept until later in the actual design process. But if we are integrated into the process early on, we can achieve a lot of these actual savings in conservation of water and energy throughout the actual process. So really what we want to do is just realize that water features are just like any other hydrological system. Water is really never lost from a hydrological system. It's just been diverted and repurposed in different sort of areas in itself. So think as the water feature is just a simple extension of the mechanical electrical system in itself. So it's just a branch line off of an existing system that's within the actual building itself, the greater site, or perhaps is even the urban center. Uh, integration into the building management system is quite critical too, so that we can use a lot of the newer technologies and monitor how these devices can help us save and conserve both energy and water. And really the biggest thing is, again, that integration into the design process quite early so we can help influence how these mechanical electrical systems can be integrated into the larger holistic system itself. Controls and integrations. So this is where we have some of the largest impact on actual water conservation. And as we all know, everything is getting smarter and there's new technology that can be incorporated into many different things. Water features is one of those things. So integrating of smart controls, uh, wind sensors, so again, some of these technologies have been used and are used throughout our actual design as best practices. So wind sensors essentially allow us to monitor the actual wind conditions themselves. And so if we have a high evaporative loss because of the wind, potentially we can reduce effects. Temperature sensors themselves. So temperature sensors can be incorporated into the actual system again to combat high evaporative loss conditions themselves. And so again, we can reduce the actual effects or the turnover rates, pumping systems, or different characteristics of the actual water features by monitoring some of these temp temperature sensors. <clears throat> Rain sensors. Same sort of tens sensory technology that can be incorporated into the actual water features themselves. So essentially what we want to do is just make sure that the actual water feature is not actually working when we have a rain event. So now these three different sensory technologies have been incorporated into larger structures such as weather stations. Um, irrigation industry itself has adopted a lot of these where you can actually monitor and gather local information about weather patterns and rainfall. Um, so there are other sort of devices that amalgamate these technologies. Flow sensors. So we have always had flow sensors within systems design themselves. So if we actually look at the actual water flow and how that's integrated with our filtration system, what we can actually do is automate the system so it's only on a demand surface. Typically, water features have been used where it's a manual process and depending on the owners and the operators, someone physically has to go to the water feature to bypass water from their filtration system. So having it in demand or automated actually reduces a lot of the actual water uses itself or the loss of the water from the system. 
uh, electrical meters. So again, tying into our building maintenance systems, we can actually make sure that the actual water feature becomes reactive to the actual energy and water loads within the actual greater building or the greater park itself or even the urban center. So if there are high peak periods, essentially the water feature can be reduced in height or there could be different characteristics or elements that are actually activated that reduce the actual water loss itself or reduces the actual energy. And really the last thing that we're starting to do and integrate is really sort of proximity sensors. Now that's sort of a catch-all phrase for any other sort of sensors. So we are talking about um, touch sensors, uh, interactive bollards. Typically we have seen them in splash pads and interactive water features themselves. Um, but there are methods essentially to understand who's within the actual space itself and activate the water feature specifically for that actual audience. Um, there are newer technologies on crowd management and security too that we can tie into the building maintenance system itself. And so essentially with that technology, we can adapt different sort of programming and different kinds of effects depending on the actual volumes or the amount of viewers within that actual space. So ideally we're designing a water feature that just accommodates the amount of people. Alternative water sources. So this is a typical first thing that we actually look at. So. As some of you all already know, there's several different ways that we can actually gain the actual water. Um, there's gray water and black water systems, rain harvesting, and also air from condensation and cooling towers themselves. So um, there are some challenges of receiving this actual water or this alternative water source. So um, gray water systems and rain harvesting systems do have some challenges. Uh, the challenge is really how that water is received and collected. Uh, potentially there are methods where there are additional sort of contamination that may enter into the system. And so as aquatic designers, we des design for worst case scenario. And so we have to put redundant filtration systems within those. So they do sometimes become cost prohibitive. If they are holistically integrated into the larger building facility though, uh, again, that water feature is an extension. It does become more cost effective. So typically what we do start with is really the air condensation from the cooling towers and the actual air conditioners. They do provide a viable source um, that le requires very little uh, filtration or addition of any sort of chemicals to be able to be used within the actual water features themselves. Um, that said, typically there is some sort of filtration that's incorporated into these actual systems and then that is used in the actual water feature. Again, if we want to look at the actual holistic integration of this actual system from these filtration systems, we want to use the actual water from the back flushing itself um, we know it's chlorinated water, so there's different ways to dissipate the actual chlorine, but potentially some of that can actually be used for the irrigation system for bioswales, and there's quite a few other alternatives. But essentially what we want to do is repurpose that water and send it on its way throughout the hydrological system of the actual site itself. Exposure. So going back to our actual last example, the University of British Columbia, uh, what we want to do is really reduce the amount of sun exposure on these actual water features. And so there's a few different ways that we can actually do that. Um, as you can see in this image example here, uh, uh, simply shade structures over top of the actual water features will prevent a lot of the evaporative loss. Uh, the Middle East region, uh, more of the arid regions, we also see a lot of shade structures over top of interactive water features. So it also provides the cooling of the actual site itself and allowing people to be more comfortable within the actual water features. So just simple uh, integrations of shading uh, of the actual water surface itself will stop some of that evaporative loss. One of the other things that we really look at is really the exposed surface area. So as many people know, um, really the evaporative loss is really based on that exposed water. So if you have a vertical nozzle, the actual surface area itself that's actually exposed actually increases the amount of evaporative loss. So this example we have here on the lower right hand corner, Texas Live, it's an interactive water feature where the actual water is contained within a lower structure and within a reservoir. So essentially we don't have any exposure to that vessel of water that's actually required for that system. So by reducing that actual surface area, again, we can reduce the evaporative loss and the actual loss of water within the greater system. Other things that we also want to look at is really sort of the effects that we're going to incorporate into these actual styles of water features. When we're, lo we're looking at conserving water, we really want to um, explore different effects that possibly could be integrated. Fog is a very simple uh, effect in itself that has a lot of sort of mass and presence. Um, 
it creates a very unique sort of experience. It also has the evaporative cooling effect in itself that does help sort of climatize some of the space in itself. But it's a very effective low flow water feature effect that can be incorporated into water features quite easily. The next are what we call these droplets. And so this is Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Um, we actually worked with Jaume Ponza, an artist who had actually came up with this uh, concept of world voices. And so it's a fair size footprint, two different sort of water features. And his idea was that essentially we have these raindrops that fall from the sky. They hit these symbols and they resonate, which is the actual voices. What's unique about this is the actual splash patterns that are created in the actual water surface. So again, we have a very low flow sort of water effect that has a very large impact on the actual space in itself and does create that very unique experience. So other alternatives to actually look at. A lot of the time we do see large uh, reflecting pools and usually that's an extension of the architectural space in itself or even perhaps a hardscape. Um, and traditionally what we would do is have large vertical nozzles in those actual displays uh, essentially, they become those uh, wayfinding or an accent to the actual space in itself. And so today we're going to show you two other examples that could potentially replace that, especially if water conservation is a high priority within the actual design intent itself. So the water voids, it's a sort of newer technology. It's really kind of a cool effect. Um, it's great for those elevated sight lines where you're looking down onto the actual water feature. Um, the effect essentially is customized to different sort of shapes, spaces, or it could be logos, it could be branded, but essentially what we have are these voids that fall out of the actual reflecting surface. So what we're doing is we're reducing that actual surface area by not using an actual vertical nozzle, but we still have that unique sort of sequencing element that gives us multiple characteristics of the actual water feature itself. Other alternatives, and we're starting to see more and more of these, are sort of air patterns. So air and trap systems that have sort of custom manifolds that can create very unique shapes within the actual reflecting pool surface. Uh, it's more of an intimate sort of relationship. So as you're closer to the water feature, you can really experience this. Again, from elevated sight lines, you can really see the impact of this. But these are just two suggestions that we can use essentially to replace some of those vertical nozzles that have that high evaporative loss because of all the surface area within the actual water itself. So wind and splash. So these are some of the actual things that we really have to manage. Um, and some of our aquatic designer friends and design builders that are on this webinar can attest to this. It's always been a challenge to really design for wind. And so our best practice is basically to design for the worst case scenario. And so we have systems and technologies that allow us to adjust the actual system itself, but sometimes it's very hard to test what the wind conditions would be specifically for the actual site because of different wind tunneling from different buildings and different sort of structures. But we do need to allow for the actual wind um, because a lot of water can be lost if the pools are not designed to capture and recirculate that actual water. The other really is splash. So a lot of splash is actually the recoil of water falling on water. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of time it's really hard to understand in our traditional methods of how much splash would actually create sort of water that escapes from the actual water vessel itself. And so what we do, is we always recommend testing. And the challenge with that is in the design process, it's very hard for owners and designers and different investors into the actual project to understand sort of the value of a testing within the actual design process. It's presumed that the aquatic designers have the greatest knowledge and understand and should have already seen this. Uh, it's unfortunate water features are custom for each installation in itself. And so not everything is known. And so we are always recommending testing. So there are challenges with testing, so not just necessarily the actual cost. <clears throat> um, so here at Crystal Fountains, we've had the luxury of actually hiring some um, programmers that have actually helped us develop our new tool, the Water Lab tool. So it started off as a visualization tool, and now we've developed it as an actual testing tool, a programming tool, um, and it's really helped us communicate to the actual clients the different sort of characteristics within that. So it is based on real physics. And so what we can do is actually start mocking up different water features within that actual simulation tool. So what it helps us to do is really reduce a lot of the actual traditional cost because we're not building that physical structure. We're not actually using a lot of the water that we would be in traditional mockups. It also decreases the amount of time that it actually takes to actually set up and construct these actual mockups. It allows for great and easy iterations for me, we've had a sense of sort of exploration because there's no cost associated with experimenting. 
And a lot of the time, different sort of effects and nozzles have actually been discovered through just pure accident. What happens if I put this nozzle against this nozzle? So it's been a very interesting tool for us to really develop different sort of effects and different kinds of experiences. And so this tool really allows us to refine that actual design process and integrate a lot of those details early on. So here you should see the actual simulation tool itself. And so there's a few examples. And what you will see as it comes on the screen essentially is uh, our wind and splash analysis. And so it's like a heat mapping that you see with other sort of technologies. And so what you'll see is essentially as there's concentration of the actual water in the splash, the uh, affected surface turns red. And then what we can do is we can interact with uh, one dimensional sort of wind in here to see how that wind will actually affect the uh, performance of the actual water feature and how it will actually move the water in and outside of the actual footprint. So again, we have the opportunity to iterate the actual concept, change the configuration of the nozzles, perhaps change the configuration of the actual water feature and really refine the actual footprint of the actual water feature to make sure that we're capturing all of that actual water. So for us, it's been a fabulous tool. I would say we get about 80% accuracy. Um, and so there is nothing like a real live actual mock-up itself, but it allows us to get through the design process and really quantify all the systems, and make sure that they're efficient and refined. So the value proposition. Oh, waste for versus perception. Again, I just want to go back to this phrase of waste. And so what is waste? As an act or instance of using or expending something carelessly or to no purpose. So what it really relies on is our own inherent value of what water is and what water features are. And as we all know, we all have individual sort of experiences and inherent value based on our own experiences themselves. And so us as aquatic designers may perhaps have some sort of bias about using actual water features in themselves, but it's always our job to work with the actual clients to make sure that we understand what their concerns are and what their perceptions are and work with them to make sure that they're comfortable in facilitating these types of water features. And so our last example here, again, it's the perception of what value really is. Irrigation, here in North America, we're lucky enough that we have abundance of actual water. And so the data says that about 30% of the water used in households is actually for outdoors. And most of that is actually for irrigation. So my last example here is really that of irrigation of the lawn. So it takes about 6.23 gallons of water for every square footage of grass, watering it for one inch of water depth. So if we look at a 20 by 40 um, lawn, it's around 500 gallons. It's actually used for every actual irrigation event in itself. So if we're looking at the actual irrigation of that lawn over four months, or let's say 60 days, it's around 29,800 gallons of water. If we remember, that's about the same amount that we would use for our typical water feature if we don't implement some of these actual conservative sort of technologies in themselves. One interesting data point that I did find too was the actual value of water. And so what's interesting we have a perception of how much it really costs. And we are very lucky here in North America. The data essentially says it's $1.50 for every thousand gallons of water. So that is 0 0.15 cents for every gallon. So the conversation isn't really about the value of the water itself, but it's the perception of the loss of the water. And so we know going through the design process, it's really a balance. And so we have all these different sort of design criteria that's enforced within the actual design process itself. We wanna make sure that we conserve and use the actual resources properly. And we wanna make sure that in the end, this water feature hasn't been compromised and is still captivated. It's that sort of experience that we have all envisioned in ourselves. It's something unique, it's brandable, it's the draw. It's really worth the exercise and the actual investment into the actual water feature itself. And at the same time, we wanna conserve that actual water. So in closing, I would just like to show you a few images of several different sort of water feature experiences. And what I would like you to think about besides your own individual experience is how do you actually quantitate, quantitate the actual value within these photographs?
And so that concludes our webinar session for today. We will go into questions and answers. Again, I would like to thank everybody for your time. We know everybody is busy. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Simon. We've had a couple of questions come in from a member of the audience. Um, um, now is a good time if you do have any sort of questions or comments, uh, put them in that ask a question box at the very bottom of your screen. So Simon, the first question that we had received is what experience do you have with proximity sensor integration on a water feature? Thank you. Um, that's very interesting because it's perceived to be newer sort of technology. The reality is proximity sensors have been around for a while. The first time I actually designed one was within Science City um, in Kansas City. That was almost 15 years ago, 16 years ago. Um, so proximity sensors can be incorporated not necessarily just into the actual water feature, but it's really the larger hardscape uh, where we can monitor sort of movement within the actual space. So it could be localized to the actual water feature or it could be in the larger area. If it's an interior space, we have seen proximity sensors put on sort of stairwells, um, elevators and escalators just to monitor how many people are going into the space. Perfect. Uh, the next question we have is, how early is too early to contact you to get involved in a water feature that has water usage considerations? Um, so it's a great question. Um, the, the reality is as soon as possible. Um, we can definitely assist in a lot of the actual des design process by integration into the actual process as early as possible. Um, though we may not be in front of the actual clients, we can work with our design uh, groups and partners to really establish some of these actual different methodologies and technologies that can be in incorporated into the actual water features. So I would say as early as possible is the best. All right, so we want to thank everyone who's joined us for today's webinar. If you have any additional questions or would like to contact directly with Simon, uh, you can reach out using the contact information on the screen as well as LinkedIn. Uh, we thank everyone for their time and have, hope you have a wonderful rest of the day, evening. Good night. Thank you.